collection is entitled, What's Up with Wood in June? A 1950s American family in myth, memory, and reality. And we are joined this afternoon by Do Dr. Catherine Eva. Catherine is a Nebraska native, born and raised in Geneva, Nebraska. She earned BA degrees in English and History from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and MA and PhD in History from Cornell University. Currently, she is an assistant professor of history at Hastings College, where she teaches a wide array of courses in U.S. history. Welcome, enjoy, and go Dr. Eva. All right. Thank you so much for joining me today, and also for your patience. I literally was using that 10 minutes ago, but, you know, of course, I would choose this moment to update. So, sorry about that. Hopefully, we can move forward and everything else will work. Um, okay. Teaching in the past year, right? We're supposed to have all gotten much better at technology, and mostly that's true, but it still uh, possesses the capacity to, to throw a wrench in the works. Um, so today, um, I am going to be talking to you, as, as Amy mentioned, about the 1950s and this kind of um, often romanticized era of the American family. And so, we're going to start with actually a video, God willing here. Um, <laughs> and we're going to watch just a few minutes of Leave It to Beaver. Now, this is maybe not the best way to kind of fool you guys into something is to start with a video, but that's what we're going to do. I'm not looking for necessarily specific answers when I ask for your observations of this particular American family. Um, I'm not fishing for a specific one, so just kind of sit back and enjoy, and we will watch for a few minutes here um, this classic TV show. Now, any of you watched this when it was, well, I won't ask when it was on the air. Have any of you seen Leave It to Beaver <laughs> at any point then or since? Okay, a lot of you are familiar with this show. Um, it was on from the late 1950s, actually, into the 1970s. Let's see here. 60, yes, 1963, sorry. Um, let's see here. Do we have sound? If we don't have sound, I am just going to... too much of this then, because we're already a little behind, and um, that's not going to be very fun to watch it in mute, but, um, all right, so this show, I guess we'll kind of fill in the, what's going on here a little bit, um, this particular episode is kind of a cute one, right? The premise is that Beaver, um, the youngest child of this typically middle class American family, has been assigned to write an essay about what his mother did before she married his father. That's, the, that's the, the concept of what they're going to write their essays about. And Beaver's having a bit of a crisis here, because in his classroom, it turns out that all of his friends' moms had done really super cool, awesome things before getting married and having kids. One was in the, the, um, the waves, uh, one was a buyer for a department store, and Beaver, as far as he knows, his mother didn't do anything cool. And he's kind of bummed about that, right? Um, so he speculates. Maybe she just hung around and waited for dad to marry her. I don't know, right? And so he has this whole question of what was my mom before she met my dad <laughs> and got married, okay? Now, Wally is a little bit more, this is the older brother, as you can probably tell, encouraging. Um, and so then Beaver goes ahead and confronts his mother with this um, with this particular uh, conundrum, and finds out, spoiler alert here, what she did was that she, uh, he asked if she had any big adventures as, um, as a girl before she married her, his father. And she won a, a swimming race once, right? That's not very exciting for, for Beaver. Um, and, and so he's kind of disappointed in what she was. This ends, as you can probably guess, with Beaver kind of uh, putting his foot in it a little bit, writing an essay wherein he claims his mother was a chorus girl and like, um, you know, ran around with gangsters and all these things, and they get a call from the principal, like, what is going on? And poor June, of course, is very worried about what the PTA and the other parents are going to think about her as a result of this uh, rather unfortunate um, little lie here that, that Beaver has told, okay? So, 
as you're kind of watching this silent film, um, <laughs> what do we notice? What kind of comes to mind when you think about the Cleavers or this 1950s American family? They're dressed up really nice. Yeah, there, there's not a yoga pant among them. <laughs> what else? <laughs> I always got the idea that she was not supposed to be smart. Okay, all right. So she's she's not necessarily supposed to be intelligent. Interesting. Okay. Other things. Again, can be about the cleavers or or families in the nineteen fifties, stereotypically more generally. Well, the house was very tidy. The house is, you know, she just immaculate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What, what else about the house? Is it a nice house? It's decorated well. Yeah, it is a very nice mm -hmm. house. It's very mm -hmm. tidy. Yeah, we get it in a lot of the the kind of the crossfade scenes. We see the outside too. Yeah, like they're you know, Ward is apparently doing okay. This is a nice house, right? All right. What else? Um, no dishwasher. I mean, she was doing the dishes, and it looked like fine china that she was washing. <laughs> yes, yes. The, the the labor that she's doing is very hands on, right? Um, and and what we see here is is doing the dishes, and for a minute, also by the way, Ward yeah. is doing the dishes. Okay. Um, <laughs> Ward does take this opportunity to claim that he's not very good at doing it, um, which, sure, whatever. <laughs> we know that we know that tactic, right? Um, <laughs> he's still wearing his tie after he's done whatever he's doing. Right. It's not loosened at all. Again. He's yeah. still dressed to the nines, yeah. So, for better or for worse, this has kind of become, in some ways, the popular conception of the 1950s family. We've got mom, we've got dad, we've got... Um, you know, in this case, you two boys um, living together in a single family home. Um, dad goes off to work. I actually don't know if Ward's profession is ever stated, but he goes away. He works um, and comes home, and, and June has the beautiful home um, ready for him and the family, right? And so this sort of becomes what we have imagined in the, in the popular culture. Does anyone know what the term is for that family, right? It comes very specifically from this time period. Nuclear family. Nuclear, nuclear family, yeah, right? Um, and so this is kind of the, the depiction of um, that a lot of us have in our minds when we think about families in the 1950s. All right. So that's cute, by the way. <laughs> Watch the rest of that on your, on your own time, I guess. Um, so when we're speaking about norm with the 1950s, right, um, it's always, or any, any period, right? <laughs> It's always important to remember that there's actually really diverse experiences. So um, while many families did fit some of this, or maybe even all of it, probably not very many fit all of it, right? Um, but fit some part of that stereotypical nuclear family, that's certainly not the case um, here. Why does this become the kind of dominant vision of what families are like in the 1950s? What might be one reason? Well, it was good entertainment. It's good entertainment, right? This is what we're consuming, right, on television. And television, right, is a super, super uh, influential way that norms are created within societies. Um, now it would probably be, I guess, YouTube. I don't know. But um, <laughs> at this point in time, people are watching these sitcoms, and a lot of the families on the sitcoms look in the same way. All right, let me see here. Let me get back to the PowerPoint. All right. And so what we have here is um, I Love Lucy. And this is an example of um, another very popular show in the 1950s, possibly the most popular show of all time, right? Like, I mean, this is, this is up there. How many of you watch I Love Lucy or have seen this one? Yeah, right? A lot of it holds up. Chocolate Factory episode? Still hilarious, right? Okay. <laughs> so, I Love Lucy. If you're familiar with this family, does this fit this 1950s norm? Okay, what are some of the ways that you're kind of saying, no, this actually is a little bit different? Interracial marriage. Interracial marriage, yes, that's, that's one of the clear kind of um, things of this. No. When we think of the nuclear family, a lot of times we are picturing an all-white family. Okay? Um, that's not the case here with, uh, with Lucia Ball and Desi Arnaz. We've got an interracial couple. Okay. Any other things that we 
His job is very non-traditional. Yeah, he is not dressed enough to go to the office, right? What is, was his job? Band, band leader. Yeah, he's a band leader. Yeah, so he's working presumably nights, basically, um, doing some rehearsals during the day. Um, but this is not a nine to five sort of commute into the city sort of uh, traditional breadwinner kind of job. They live in an apartment. They live in an apartment. Yeah, they're not doing the the suburban thing at all. They live in a New York City um, apartment. They that, bedroom scenes, but they're in separate beds. Yes, <laughs> they they uh, the 1950s. Yes, the the separate beds. Right, you can't even apply. Right, the. Um, married you couples. Have are, Ricky, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> and famously, right? What about that? You yes. know the TV kind of landmark that we get she's from. Yeah. She's she's yeah she's the first uh, first woman to be shown on television pregnant. So um, it's a little unusual there that way too. But, but yes, they overcame the two separate beds and produced uh, little Ricky. So <laughs> yes, we have uh, the the. The apartment, the non-traditional job, the interracial marriage, anything else? She was unstoppable. She yeah. was unstoppable. Can you think of a heroine maybe a little bit less like June Cleaver? <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay. Um, they're dressed similarly, and that's maybe about where it ends. Lucy is always up to, to some shenanigans um, or another, much to um, Ricky's great dismay um, and horror. Okay? So... When we're kind of thinking about this, right, we see, all right, that the that television is shaping what we see, but even in the 1950s, that's being disrupted a little bit um, to reflect a different kind of American family. But right? wasn't she also portrayed as a little ditzy? Yeah. I mean, yeah, so you see that, that, or maybe lacking, I, I didn't really see it, I'm just told. It's, uh, that, that sometimes, like, lacking common sense, or... I don't know how to put it because I should not really watch it. Ricky would probably say that, for sure, <laughs> that she's lacking in common sense. Yeah. Um, I think you're right. I don't know that she's meant to be portrayed as an especially educated character, um, but she does maybe have a mind for schemes. Um, they do usually go awry, um, yeah. so I guess, uh, yeah. But, but you're right. She's not necessarily portrayed as an intellectual powerhouse, mm -hmm. um, but certainly someone who has a, a big imagination, um, <laughs> shall we say. <laughs> And, and a sense for what, what might be possible, um, even, if, even if it's not your traditional kind of, of book smart um, person here. So let's talk a little bit about what the 1950s American family really looks like here. Okay, so what's, what's the reality? Um, so the first thing that we want to talk about is that obviously this is an intensely family-focused decade, right? That's not, that's not just, oh, TV changed how we saw the 1950s. There is very much a root of truth to that. The birth rate in the United States, of course, as you guys and many of you are part of, right, <laughs> grew exponentially um, starting directly after World War II. Um, baby boomers become the largest generation in American history, and, and there's, there's just babies, babies, babies everywhere, okay? And so what to kind of understand why that happens, why there is this real emphasis that, that is factual, on um, on family life, it's important to go back a little bit. My students love this, right? I'm always like, context matters, right? So they sign up for a Civil War class and then spend two weeks on the 1840s. Sorry. Um, so I'm going to do that here to, to you guys a little bit as well. Um, we're going to go back to the 1930s to kind of look at where this baby boom and where this intense focus on domesticity is coming from, okay? So what happens in the 1930s? It's pretty notable. The Great Depression, yeah. Talk about defining a decade, right? Um, and so in the 1930s, family dynamics are intensely impacted by the Great Depression. What are some of the effects you might expect to see if there's this massive economic crash? What might that mean for families? What? Don't throw anything away. Okay, so, so intense frugality, yes, very much. Relocation. Relocation, yeah. That's, I'm glad you said that. Actually, a lot of times my students don't realize how mobile the 1930s were. People moved around a lot. Well, some of the men had to go off to find work yeah. after the WPA. Yeah. So yeah. It was, it was. It was. It was a lot of, of upheaval, um, moving for work, even as a family, or as you said, um, individuals leaving and trying to support from afar. Sure. Yeah. Self reliance. Self reliance. People had to learn how to do things for themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so learning new, new sorts of skills, um, finding ways to support your family when maybe a regular paycheck is not forthcoming, 
Um, how do you do that? You know, and it maybe didn't impact everyone. I did oral histories mm -hmm. on both my father and mother's side. Both of them lived through the Depression. Neither one of them even mentioned it. Okay, so interesting. So you think everybody suffered? My parents didn't seem to. Okay, yeah, so it does have a very uneven effect, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so while the kind of, again, our visions of the 1930s are bread lines and mass unemployment, and that certainly was reality for a lot of people, um, others go through with a loss in um, hours or wages, but are still able to feed their families, um, keep them clothed, and especially if they're children during that time, they may or may not really absorb the, the, the magnitude of what's going on on kind of a national scale. What might this mean in terms of deciding to build your family if you're facing this kind of very dreary economic situation? I have more kids, more workers. More kids, okay, interesting. Or the reverse. Or the reverse. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have reservations about having yeah, more right. people in the family. Yeah. Coming from the farm, you had kids for farm labor. For farm labor, yeah. So yeah. agriculturally, that so. for an agricultural family, that might have yeah. been a bit of a bonus. Are you say that, that's kind of what I was going to say too. Is that um, I think that for a lot of people in like an urban area, they might have be having less children, less mouths to feed. But um, I do know my grandmother grew up in. Um, Kansas and in a rural area and so she had lots of brothers and sisters because they needed more help on the farm because they couldn't hire anyone to work on the farm. Ah, your free labor, yes. Yeah, <laughs> makes sense. <laughs> right, so that's a very interesting um, kind of observation and, I, and I'm glad to hear that. I want to incorporate that going forward. Um, so statistically, on a national-wide average, what we see is a drastic decline in births. More people uh, kind of kind of interpreting this as there's going to be more mouths to feed, this is a really just kind of chancy situation and <laughs> we don't want to bring more children into this, we don't know how to support them. Um, and so there's actually the, the birth rate in the United States no sex, okay? Um, now, as you guys pointed out, there's very good reasons why some people might not be following that trend um, in terms of labor. But nationally, as a whole, um, we're seeing kind of a, a, a pretty steep drop off in the birth rate. Same huh? thing in the pandemic right now. Yeah, yeah. uncertainty <laughs> kind of makes people decide, eh, maybe I don't want to have that, that additional child or first child, right, or anything like that. How about marriages? Any effect on marriages? They're just these stressful, like I'm thinking when you see this, it, mm -hmm. at least it's based on a real story, right? Mm -hmm. And they actually give him up, mm -hmm. their whatever 12-year-old son, because <laughs> there's too many mouths to eat. So he went from a very cohesive family unit, and what would that do to a mother, mm -hmm. a mother and father, what that do their relationship? Did the wife really yes. agree to give them up? And yeah, it's it's a tough thing to live through, as we've all experienced now, pandemic and economic stresses over the past year. Um, and it's, it really does take a toll on families. Um, the divorce rate um, is, is fairly low during this time, but the desertion rate is actually quite high. Um, so, so this does take a toll on families, um, whether they're moving for work, or whether the stress just gets to be too much and, and somebody pieces out, um, it's, uh, it's uh, very, very disruptive to existing marriages. How about if you're young? Let's say that, that it's 19, 1930. You're a 22-year-old guy. Does this shape your, your choices you're making about marriage, maybe? Yeah. Not if they want a family, if you have a way to support them. Exactly. The age of marriages rises. I've seen... I've seen some numbers of average up to two years. I don't think it's actually quite that high. It, it, that seems like a lot in a short period of time. But statistically, then the age of marriage rises during the 1930s for both men and women, and it's exactly for the reason you say. Um, this, if we get married, there's a there's a strong likelihood of children. Where are we going to live? Um, supporting a single person is a lot less expensive. It's a lot easier to do to kind of fend for yourself. Um, and and so what we see is a delay in the marriage rate or marriage um, marriage age, as well in the 1930s. Okay, so the 1930s is is a really destabilizing period actually. And we're talking about the American family in a lot of ways. So 1940s, things are going to chill out, right? No, no, <laughs> no, they're not. What goes on in the 1940s? World War II. World War II. Yeah, like one thing after another here. What effects are we going to see on the American family? in the 1940s. All right, so first of all, you guys probably identified some of them already. They're going to carry over for the 1930s. We're going to see, once again, incredible mobility. 
right? People are moving around the country again to take defense industry jobs, which are mostly located um, in the south and west. Okay, so some people are moving for that reason. Mm -hmm. Of course, men are, are moving and being drafted um, and moving to train, all of these sorts of things. And so we have uh, that sort of effect as well. There's long separations, right? If someone in your family is, is drafted um, to go to Europe, uh, even in the great, the great case scenario that they come back, they may be gone for a number of years, right? So it's highly disruptive to family life in that time period as well. However, we see some different responses to the upheaval of the 1940s. So let's say you're, we'll take our 22 year old young man here again, and it is 1941, let's say, 1942, okay? Are you going to delay marriage like someone 10 years younger, uh, 10 years previous would have done? Not necessarily. Not necessarily, why not? I don't know why he got married right before he shipped out. He got yeah. married right before he shipped out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and right when they give up. Actually, we see a skyrocketing of marriage rates during early World War II. Okay, there's a lot of marriages. And you guys are identifying those those reasons very well. Right? There's uncertainty. If you've got this girl, you love her, like, hey, why don't we get married? And um, you know, uh, Make this, make this commitment before I might not come back. There might not be another chance to do this, right? So there's sort of that kind of romantic angle, I guess. There's also a pragmatic angle, right? If, uh, if you are killed, then your, then your um, surviving spouse will potentially get some, um, some benefits and things like that, right? So that's, that's another reason. There was a monthly compensation to wives as well. My mother was going to sit in this. Okay. So there's, you know, there's romantic and there's practical kind of reasons to why people might make this choice. The mobility also comes into play here too, right? Any of you have parents or grandparents who met each other in a wartime setting, like a defense defense or base sort of thing? Okay, right, a little surprising. Um, okay, I, this happens too, though, right? You have uh, you know a bunch of twenty something twenty somethings um, working at um, defense industry bases. Um, near where there are air bases um, or, or military bases, um, there's, there's social activities, right? There's dances and things like this. Um, and so women are meeting men and um, kind of having these whirlwind romances, right? This is something that's also perpetuated in pop culture. There's a Judy Garland movie called The Clock. Um, if you've seen that, I can't find it online, but there is a trailer on YouTube, so if you're, you're curious. Um, and basically the, the, the meet cute, they meet under a, a clock in a train station, this young woman and a serviceman, um, and they fall in love throughout the course of, I believe it's a single day, um, <laughs> and decide to marry before he ships out the following day. So, um, interesting choices being made there. But <laughs> it did happen, so uh, that's, that's kind of part of this romanticization of the quick, um, quick marriage rate, right? So, um, after the war, right, things are calming down a little bit. Some of these marriages last, some don't. There's actually a real spike in divorces right after World War II um, because it turns out sometimes knowing somebody for two days and then marrying them isn't a super great idea. <laughs> um, so we do see actually a quick, uh, quick spike in divorces before that, before that kind of settles out um, a little bit as well. So, when we get to the 1950s, Sometimes it's easily explained by economic reasons, and, and it, we would be unwise to ignore that, right? Um, the United States does, uh, there's, a, there's a little bit of economic kind of instability after the war, but by and large, this is a really good time for the American economy, especially as we get into the 1950s. There are many jobs available. Um, they tend to be well-paying, or at least commensurate with the cost of living, which is always a, a desirable thing. Um, and, and so economically, people are enabled to have families in a way that they weren't, certainly in the 1930s, right? But I think that also those other kind of factors of instability are also driving this, right? So we, my students hear this, right? And they're like, oh my gosh, like people are 20 years old and they're deciding to get married, like why would you do that? Or uh, marrying somebody at age 17, that seems kind of nuts to them. But it makes a little more sense once you think about what those 17 and 18 year olds lived through, right? They came up, um, they grew up during the depression. Um, they may have seen kind of that family instability. They get drafted into the war, they've lived through that. 
you've lived through the better part of two decades of instability, maybe settling in and having a nice cozy home sounds pretty good, right? And so I actually think that that has a lot to do with this um, kind of return of um, domestic focus in, um, in the 1950s that we see, okay? The other reason, and we'll come back to this, this term that we mentioned earlier, the nuclear family, right? Historian Elaine Tyler May has hypothesized that actually anxiety, right? So things aren't free and clear, clear in the 1950s. Um, there's kind of a lot of anxiety going on about what? More. Nuclear war. war, yeah. What is the USSR doing? Um, this is kind of overhanging the entire decade um, or two. And I think because it doesn't escalate into a hot war, for us living now, it's maybe hard for us to appreciate that this is actually quite terrifying. Um, and, and it's a very real and present threat um, to most Americans at this point in time. And again, what, what um, this historian, Elaine Tyler May says, is that some of this domesticity is a reaction to that. We can't control these terrifying things that are going on. We can't control what's happening in the Soviet Union. We might all be blown up tomorrow. This is very scary. So let's hunker down together. Let's create at least a safe space within these walls where we can be together as a family. And so um, the, can I have a picture of this here? No, no, okay. Um, the emblematic kind of um, moment of this is that in 1959, a couple in Miami is chosen by a bomb shelter company, right? It's the thing you have in the 1950s, we'll install a bomb shelter in your backyard. They sponsor a contest, and so they, they say, all right, um, anybody who's getting married at, uh, pretty soon, we will give you a free two-week honeymoon to Mexico if immediately after your marriage you go down and live in one of our shelters for two weeks, right? <laughs> and so uh, there's over 100 applicants, right? Two-week two week honeymoon sounds pretty great. Um, and so this couple that wins, um, they go down into the into this. And, th and there's a lot of press coverage, as of course the bomb shelter company intended that there would be. Um, Time Magazine uh, does, a, does a, pe a feature on them. Um, there's lots of wink, wink, nudge, nudge, you know, togetherness, ha ha, right? Uh, these newlyweds here. Um, but again, it kind of shows that your safety is within the home, right? Within your backyard, with your family, um, trying to ride out the effects um, of this kind of horrifying new nuclear capable world. Um, and, and being safe in that way. Okay? We also see the Cold War playing out in domesticity in terms of the kitchen debates. All right, and so, um, you guys have heard of this, right? No? Okay, oh good, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> anyone recognize this guy? Yeah. Nixon, yes. <laughs> Nixon at this point in time is the Vice President of the United States. And so, um, throughout the 1950s and 1960s, there are a number of meetings between US leaders and Soviet leaders. This particular um, political stunt, shall we say, <laughs> um, was, was um, part of a way of kind of proving not military su superiority, but lifestyle superiority, right? So is the American capitalist demo democratic way of living better than the communist one? And so in Moscow, the United States sends representatives to build a sample house and several sample kitchens, right? They're all sponsored by, you know, GE has their kitchen version or whatever here. Um, but it is meant to illustrate the house version is it's a $14,000 house that, quote, the average American worker can afford. It's all outfitted with all these futuristic technologies, um, the, the washing machine, the um, dishwasher, all of these things that, um, that Americans have and can take advantage of. Um, that, that Soviets <coughs> presumably cannot. And so we have kind of this extraordinary moment where we have Richard Nixon, of all people, right? Depend Is that Khrushchev? And, Is that yeah, Khrushchev? Yeah, and Khrushchev, yes. Um, debating the merits of an automatic lemon juicer. <laughs> okay? Um, Khrushchev's like, why don't you just put the lemon in the cup and squeeze it? Like, it takes longer to, to get out the thing and like do that or whatever. And Nixon's like, you're missing the point. Like, look at all of our, our domestic capabilities here. Um, and so it's it's very, like, it's, it is kind of humorous. Like it, it's, you know. um, but what's going on is how in, in kind of entrenched this idea of domesticity is with 
how Americans are starting to view themselves, right? And how they want to portray um, the American way of life, right? And this comes to a fore here, really very clearly in terms of Soviet womanhood versus American womanhood, which is the superior way. And so you get kind of these very different, this is obviously Soviet propaganda, as you can tell with that very friendly looking Joseph Stalin, <laughs> and not commensurate with reality. Um, but they're sort of trying to say, our women, you know, in communism, women are equal and they can, they can do all these great empowered things or whatever. Um, and Americans would probably respond with, no, this is actually what Soviet women are doing. They're doing hard work physical labor, um, they're away from their children all day, and isn't that terrible? And then they hold up the contrast image, right? This is what our women do all day. They're working, preserving their own home, they have all these great labor-saving devices, um, and they're able to spend this great quality time um, with their children in their beautiful modern kitchens, right? So we have this fundamental kind of, what's the best way to organize society? What's the best thing for women to do? And it kind of becomes a little bit of an emblem um, for this, for the, the Cold War, right? And, and this, con this conversation about which, which way of life is better, right? And so Americans really double down, I think, into this idea of domesticity, right? It's really bound up in um, people's kind of natural responses to the, to the trauma of the 30s and 40s. We'll, we'll phrase it with a, in a modern way, but frankly, yes, that was traumatic for a lot of people. Um, and, and really kind of double down into this vision um, of, of domesticity, right? The other thing too, anyone go to the consumerism uh, conversation? Was it earlier? Okay. I know there was a talk about consumerism, right? Uh, Americans are ready to buy, right? So this also becomes a part of, of domesticity is these quote unquote labor saving devices, whether it's a vacuum cleaner um, or an automatic lemon juicer, <laughs> whatever it is. Um, Americans haven't bought these things since the 20s in, in a lot of cases, right? 30s, you can't afford it. 40s, um, there's a lot of restrictions on consumer goods being produced. Um, and hey, I mean, I can't, I can't fault someone for wanting a working washing machine. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's important. So uh, this, this really is kind of a flowering of domestic products. Um, look at all this stuff you can buy, and most of it's going to go toward making your home a pleasant, safe, and happy place to be. You've got Soviet and American stuff here. Was there some sort of a feeling of patriotism in terms of being willing to be domestic mm -hmm. and participate in consumerism? That's a great question. Um, and, and I think that, like as a historian, I would say yes. I think that on an individual level, I don't know that people actually kind of viewed it that articulately, right? You, you know, I think that's shaping a lot of what's going on that this is what our women can do, and this is why the American way is superior, right? And we kind of feeling we're a part of that, um, rather than kind of having the conscious thought process of, I am doing this so that I'm better than so It's like yielding jobs mm -hmm. in the return home, yeah. yielding jobs to men returning home, and then becoming mm -hmm. part of the domestic culture. Yeah, so women's roles, I'm, I could talk for like a lot longer. I'm sorry about this. Um, but women's, women's roles from the 40s to the to the 50s are it's almost a like kind of a whiplash experience, right? Um, you have a lot of women who are working during the 1940s. They're working during the 1930s too, actually. It's pretty pretty high rates of women employed at that point in time. Um, the difference is that they get paid a lot better in the 1940s than they have prior to that point. Um, and that gives some women kind of a sense of independence. Now, there's a lot of work during the war and after the war that emphasizes that these are men's jobs. These jobs belong to soldiers, and when they get back, you need to go, go back home, right? Don't be a welder, okay? Um, there's, there's this uh, very specific kind of push. And there's a couple good videos on YouTube, actually, if you're interested in that. There's one called Women in Steel. Um, it's about women in the steel industry, the 1950s, and it's um, government propaganda film. It specifically says, you know, has these women saying, like, I know that this job belongs to a soldier, and when he comes home, I'm going to go have babies. It's a very, very clear the messaging of that film. Um, some women, of course,
folks are very happy to do that, right? It's easy, I think, from 2021 to be like, oh my gosh, this is, <laughs> they kicked them out of their jobs and sent them home, right? That that's, sounds so sad. Um, but some women are on board with that. That's what they want. They are also yearning for that kind of stability, stability and family life um, and, and want that. Other women, though, do find it kind of a disappointment, right? They've had this taste of financial independence, of doing really meaningful work, um, and, they, and they very much see their war work in particular as meaningful. Um, and then they don't really have that same kind of feedback that what you're doing really matters. And so some women really, uh, really miss that. There's a fantastic documentary, and it's from 1980, so it's a little bit, the production quality is low, um, and it's a little hard to get a hold of, but I do think it is available online. Um, 1980, um, The Life and Times of Rosie the Riveter. Fantastic interview with a bunch of women who, um, who did that war work and kind of the process of what it was to, how did you go and get these jobs? What did it feel like to, to leave them? And it, I think it really does a great job of, of capturing the nuance of how a lot of different women may have felt about, about that transition. All right, so 1950s, I'm getting the, the, the signal here. Uh, 1950s um, family, we do eventually see some pushback on this, as you guys know. Um, in 1963, Betty Friedan publishes The Feminine Mystique, which is sort of considered some of the work of second wave feminism. Um, she talked to her college classmates, she herself was a college graduate, and noticed that many women in her circle were feeling kind of this dissatisfaction. She called it the problem with no name, um, and, and kind of writes about it and has just a lot of response to it. It turns out a lot of women are, are kind of feeling that way. And so, you know, I'm not pulling this on for or anything like that. Um, but this, what we see in the 1960s and 1970s is, is a gradual decline in the kind of this really um, focused domesticity that we see in the 1950s. So there's things about the 1950s family, I think, that are really great. There's a strong middle class. This is the strongest the American middle class ever is. Um, at any point in U.S. history, and a lot of families are, in fact, able to afford really good or at least stable lives um, for themselves and their children, and that's great. Um, that's, you know, I think the goal. <laughs> um, and so, so this really is a time where a lot of those things are enabled um, for people. And the downside here is that, of course, this doesn't appeal to, or doesn't apply to everyone, right? There are um, groups that are left out very much of this nuclear family kind of individual um, individual home ownership, um, specifically African Americans, right, are, are a big group that are left out of this. Um, they either do not have access to the same GI Bill benefits, or more to the to the problem, they have trouble getting home loans or buying houses in um, neighborhoods which often have race based covenants. Um, you cannot sell this uh, house to um, a person who, who is African American. On the West Coast, a lot of times that included Asian Americans as well. Um, and so there are groups of, of people who are very much excluded um, from some of the benefits of, of this era. Okay? But nevertheless, this is a, uh, an era that, that has a lot of staying power kind of in the popular memory. It has a lot of staying power in terms of nostalgia. A lot of you grew up then, right? <laughs> and, so, and so it has that. Um, and continues to influence us, right? I think that that's, that's maybe one of its enduring legacies, is that policies and things to, like that today are often referencing this um, particular vision and model of family and, um, and trying to either recreate it or say that's old and outdated, right? Depending on, like, all positions on the political spectrum use, use family uh, in the 1950s family um, for their own purposes, right? So, um, all right, I think that is, thanks for being around for the other